the liturgy and the ritual and the robes and all that we go through and the creeds and the articles, which is why I always say that when a Catholic marries a Baptist, you have now created a Methodist, a Methodist. family. <laughs> God have mercy on us all. Did I screw that up? And you can get Listen Up for only 14 Well, today we are going to have a great conversation. We have two guests. Matt Russell's not with us. He's off doing Matt Russell things. He also had his his father-in-law passed away, Hmm. and so we want to be praying for him and Michelle. But we have David Worthington, who is the Director of Global Relationships for The New Room, which we're going to learn all about here and and how that fits for our history as Methodists, and John Wesley. And as people will hear when you talk, you're not from South Georgia or (laughs) Texas. No, thank you very much for the welcome. I think the accent <laughs> confirms I'm not from South Georgia or Texas. Wait, you've been to those places? I have been to those places, yes. Yeah. And uh, unlike John Wesley, I was welcomed in South Georgia. <laughs> so, you're right. We share some history there. So, And also we have Bob Johnson, who was uh, executive pastor mm-hmm. here at Chapelwood for had two stints back and mm-hmm. forth and retired just a couple of years ago. Five. And five years ago. That's hard to believe. Yeah. Wow. And the connection, reason I asked Bob to come, if he, if he was willing and able to come, was that Bob actually took a, a group from Chapelwood right. at least once. Yeah. And I know that you did the historic tour on the coast of Georgia and the Northeast, That's but you right. also went over yeah, to... Yeah, first we went to England, okay. and um, Newham is one of the places we went, where we met David. <clears throat> and then later we did the tours of Savannah and um, uh, the Northeast, the, tracing our Wesleyan roots in America. But we were inspired to do that by our visit to the New Room. <laughs> and the great thing about Bob Johnson is he geeks out about a lot of things, but mm-hmm. this is one of the things... All this history of Wesley in America and in England and all that is another one of the things that gets him going. So I thought, man, if I invite Bob, <laughs> all I have to do is just kind of hold up the stop sign. Or the, <laughs> you know, the guy on the airport tarmac just like directing everybody. Yeah. Well, David, tell us a little bit about yourself as we start and what is the new room for people who have never heard of that mm-hmm. before? Okay, so John Wesley first came to Bristol. Uh, Bristol is a city in the the west of England, about 120 miles west of London. Uh, He first came to Bristol in the year 1739. He was invited by his friend George Whitfield. Whitfield, along with Charles Wesley and others, of course, had been a member of the Holy Club at Oxford University. And uh, it is from there that the word Methodism was first used, a rather mocking term for the methodical manner. Um, George was wanting to return to America and he invited a number of his friends and all of whom politely declined. Uh, John, however, thought, no, I think that uh, this is something I should follow through on. So he arrived in Bristol end of March 1739. He accompanies Whitfield on his preaching engagements that day and then just a couple of days later he preaches in the open air for the very first time. As far as the new room's concerned, essentially it's uh, the Methodist uh, oldest meeting house in the world and built as a meeting house. We always have to remember, of course, that in Wesley's time it was a Methodist movement, not a, a church in the way that we would understand that today. So essentially what Wesley does is create a space in which people can come and learn their Bible, um, uh, but also offer practical help and support, uh, things like uh, a food bank, a dispensary of free medicines, uh, uh, education, um, particularly to those who were the poor and disenfranchised in the city. Uh, Bristol in the 18th century, second largest city, and of course we're seeing the growth with the Industrial Revolution, so more people coming into the city from off the land. Um, and so Wesley's theology, as throughout his life, is a very practical response to the needs. So we open the building to people and uh, tell these stories, and we hope that they will learn more about what John and Charles did in the city, but also um, feel challenged and commissioned to uh, carry on their work and their ministry wherever they happen to be. Um, We do welcome folks from all over the world. The Vista book confirms that. Um, And when John Wesley said to the Bishop of Bristol, I look upon all the world as my parish, I don't think even John would Mm -hmm. have understood how, you know, two, three centuries later, the world really is coming to Mr. Wesley's parish in Bristol. It's interesting to me that, so this, the, the new room that John Wesley started, when he went to Bristol in 1739 and became a chapel, a food bank, a dispensary, like a community center, whatever you want to call it, and and places where the pastors could come stay. And, and, but that mission and the work, uh, it wasn't like it stopped for a hundred years and then started back. It's been going 
continuously since 1739? Yes, yeah, so the building uh, from 1739 uh, was in Methodism up until the early part of the 19th century. Uh, it was then taken over by the Welsh Calvinist Church and they were in there for about a century, but uh, of course their roots are essentially in the uh, Wesleyan movement. Uh, in the 1920s, um, the Welsh influence in the city of Bristol had begun to decline and so there was a Methodist benefactor uh, who paid not only for the purchase of the new room but also of Charles Wesley's house. That's the other property that we have and uh, essentially those were restored to the ways in which they were in the 18th century and uh, we now make them available. Uh, we've got a museum in those rooms above that you just mentioned. These are the rooms where John and the other preachers would stay when they were in Bristol uh, and in that sense you know many people when they go into John's study or bedroom uh, you know really have a, a very emotional response to that and uh, rightly so you know this is really where the the DNA of Methodism rests in my opinion um, that you know Wesley worked out where the next sort of preaching engagements were going to be for himself and often of course for the other preachers so this is really where you know Methodism takes off as the movement that we know from the 18th century. You told a story Sunday when you were speaking here at Chapelwood about uh, where the name New Room came from. Tell that story. <laughs> yeah so when John Wesley first arrived in the city he began preaching in the open air uh, and to use his phrase he submitted to be more vile um, he was also engaged with the religious societies because Bristol was already um, a non-conformist city, uh, Baptists and Quakers, um, and he went to speak at a meeting house in the city, uh, and so many people had crowded into the upper room to listen to John speak that the, the floor uh, just could not take the weight, and as a result it collapsed, and so amongst the chaos was the proclaimed to those in the room at the time, we must build ourselves a new room. Uh, and that's where that title comes from. And it's interesting to me that it's very much a focus on it being a room. Uh, the building only had to be registered for religious worship later. Um, and I think it's interesting when we engage with people who have no background in Methodism or church that they often come in and remark on how it doesn't look like a church. You know, many of the things that people expect to see, stained glass windows, crosses or crucifixes, for example, it's a very plain and simple design. And in that sense, I think it's a very non-threatening environment in which people can come. Over my 17 years associated with the new room, I've had numerous conversations where people, I think, just open up within the space and ask questions. And many times people have said to me, I've thought about that question and wondered what the answer was for, for years. Um, so I think that it's a special space which allows those conversations to take place. Um, and in that sense, you know, Wesley was prepared to go out in the open air. He was prepared to invite people to the meeting house, uh, essentially wanting to engage with people where they were on their terms. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the New Room seeks to continue to do today. What's So a, a couple of things I just have to keep in mind. Some people listen to our podcast. They have no idea who John Wesley is, or we say Charles. You know, John Wesley was the founder of Methodism. Mm -hmm. He was in the Church of England. Methodism whether you are Methodist or know anything about Methodism, the movement itself has had a profound impact on Christianity around the world. Theologically, some people, some historians attribute, and you might speak to this or not, that the reason, one of the reasons why England, the United Kingdom, didn't have a revolution like America and France was that religious movement, the Methodist movement was a one part of that whole thing that kind of yeah, revival, re Methodist, revival, revival of yeah. Methodist revival at that time kind of led, it was just the right time, right place kind of thing historically. And then Charles was John's brother. His who's, kid brother. <laughs> his kid brother who also is now, you know, one of the greatest hymn writers mm -hmm. in the history of. Well, with respect, John, the greatest. <laughs> the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we have some probably Baptists and others, but yeah, I mean, I think he is. There are Charles Wesley hymns in the Baptist hymnal. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I remember in, in seminary studying, you know, Charles, uh, you know, John Wesley was a practical theologian. He never had a systematic theology that he wrote or developed. Um, it wasn't real creedal, except for the Church of England and the Articles of Religion. All those were important. But uh, he was very much like, how, what difference does this faith make in the life that we live? Which right. is why that practicality. But Charles, was in, in a way, even though he was a hymn writer, 
in some ways, I think he was more of the one that kind of established the there's a there's a deep theology in the hymns. Yes, that yes. comes out of that whole Methodist um, movement. Yes, and I think what Charles does is uh, take sections of uh, the Bible and essentially put them into a poetic verse. Uh, we must remember that many of the people who responded to the Wesleys in the early Methodists were illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so presenting them with a, a Bible or a hymn book was not really going to be a lot of use to them. So one of the joys of Charles's hymnody is that it allows people to learn their Bible by singing it. Uh, and I think in that sense, the gift that Charles Wesley has given to us with his hymnody continues to this day. Um, I often ask the question, you know, when did you read or uh, hear a John Wesley sermon being preached, in contrast to when did you last sing a Charles Wesley hymn? And invariably, of course, it will be the hymn. Um, uh, just a quick sort of story to share with you. A number of years ago, I uh, had the opportunity to speak to a group of school children at the New Room, and uh, I thought, well, how am I going to sort of, you know, link in John and Charles Wesley? Um, and I think just a few days before, uh, William and Kate had got married in Westminster Abbey, and one of the hymns that they chose was Love Divine, or Love's Excelling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I said, well, how many of you watched The Royal Wedding? And every child put mm -hmm. up their hand. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, one of the hymns that was sung in Westminster Abbey was mm -hmm. written by Charles Wesley. And again, you've got that mm -hmm. link. Um, so it's a real joy to be able to sort of see that kids actually get it in terms of, oh, yeah, you know, that statue is not just a, a bronze statue of some ancient figure that nobody knows who they are. Um, you know, this is hymnody that's alive and well. And uh, in that sense, Charles's hymnody is the gift that continues to give. Well, as we're still talking about the history, Bob, you took a group of pilgrims we call them when yeah. we travel and yeah just talk about your experience going and 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 people's experience of discovering hearing this story i'd imagine some folks who went with you didn't know as much about the history of this stuff as as they came to know right it it you know and i i knew a lot of the story and it was still very impactful to me also i mean i mean it's the difference between reading about something and and walking there and you know it's like going to jerusalem and walking where yeah. jesus walked um yeah, so a lot of the people uh, on our trip um, had a very, um, it was a very moving experience. Like when I come back, I want to know more about John Wesley. I want to know more about Charles Wesley. Um, one of the things that was, um, I want to talk about the communion table at the in the new room in a moment. But one of the experiences we got to have, we went to uh, Epworth, which is um, the the church. Well, Epworth is a city, but there was a church there where John Wesley and Charles Wesley's father was the pastor. And there's a, a baptismal font in that church, and it's still used as a church. Um, it's not a museum; it's worship every Sunday. So there's a there's a baptismal font in there, and uh, just to realize that baptismal font was already 600 years old when the Wesleys were baptized in it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we got to to do a remember your baptism service from that font, and to just wow. realize that you know John and Charles Wesley as babies were baptized baptized by their dad uh, with water from this font. It was just, uh, just incredible. That's amazing. Do um, uh, you want to tell the lead up to the, to the communion story? Why was there no communion table built in the new room? And then how come there was one there when I got there? Well, we put one there especially for you, Bob. No, no. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know you were coming. <laughs> yeah, we knew you were coming. Um, so it was built as a meeting house. Uh, the building was actually designed by a, a Quaker, uh, and many people who visit us remark at how it uh, you know, it looks like a Quaker meeting house. Um, initially, John would encourage his followers to seek to take communion at local Anglican churches. Uh, we have to remember John was not seeking the Methodist movement to separate from the Church of England. I think this is an important point to emphasize, especially in the environment in which we now live, mm -hmm. <laughs> with disaffiliations and so forth. Um, both John and Charles were Anglican priests, and they died Anglican priests. That Methodism was a movement within their church, not um, a separate church. And so therefore, if you want sacraments, you go to the church. You go to St. 
St. James, I think, is the name of the church in Bristol. Yes, so uh, St. James is the nearest yeah. uh, Anglican church to the New Room, probably way back in the mists of time. Uh, the land on which the New Room stands would have been owned by St. James. Obviously, it was the largest landowner for, for, for centuries beforehand. So it, what John Wesley does is to encourage the followers to go to take communion at local Anglican churches. Mm -hmm. What happened, sadly, is that many of those who turned up were told they were not welcome. Uh, they were either dressed inappropriately or not making a financial contribution towards the work of the Anglican Church. A lot of them were col colliers, is that what you call colliers, them? Colliers, yes. Work in the coal uh, mines. Work in the coal mines, yeah. yeah. Bristol um, has a, 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 a history with, with, with mining, particularly in the eastern part of the city. That was one of the first groups that George Whitfield engaged with and Wesley subsequently. So... As such, they were a really rough bunch, and I think many people were either scared or intimidated. Um, so the fact that the Wesley's and the early Methodists reached out to them, one could, I think, quite legitimately argue it was rather disingenuous of the Anglican Church to argue that uh, the Wesley's had come into town and essentially preached in their diocese without their permission. The truth of it was that mm. these Anglican clergymen wanted nothing to do mm. with the Kingswood miners, the Colliers. Mm. So there's a famous story of how on one Sunday Charles actually takes a group uh, to Temple Church um, and is refused entry. And so they head to the new room about half a mile away and it's there that they distribute the communion. And I think Wesley, with some reluctance, uh, put in the communion table and rail because he, at that point, realised that the Anglican Church was not going to embrace uh, these Methodists um, and welcome them for communion. Um, so the table uh, that we have at the New Room is an original 18th century table that John himself uh, gifted to the New Room for mm. that purpose. And we don't have a worshipping congregation at the new room but we do have a friday lunchtime communion service so we welcome uh, methodist ministers from around the bristol area but we're always happy to uh, extend the invitation um, to other ministers who are visiting and uh, i think in that sense bob you probably want to take up the story about your experience yeah so so um we were we were at the new room and um i don't think did i know this was going to happen or did you tell me when i got there i don't remember but um I, I was able to serve communion and um consecrate the elements and serve communion from the very table that john wesley served from uh to to our pilgrims and uh you could just i mean you could just sense you could taste you could feel the significance of that to people there was an altar rail uh around the table and people just lingered there for a long time after they received just you know to think about that table 300 years ago there's coal miner Methodists in this very place um, and it, it's just uh, it was an amazing sense of history um, spiritual presence and connection to, to the Wesleys and and I think the most significant thing that came from that to the people that came back to Houston from that trip um, was just in a realization of um, how committed John Wesley and Charles Wesley were to disciple making discipleship uh, in the environment in which they found themselves in the in the 1700s, um, you know, when it occurred to me when John Wesley said, "We need to build us our new room." <laughs> if you were to say that today, you would say, "Oh, time for a capital campaign." Yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, it was essentially that way yeah. in which so, it was built. That talk Wesley about the uh, the class meeting and how it came yeah. out of that capital campaign. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes feel a little embarrassed, really, because, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, if it didn't start in Bristol for John Wesley, it just didn't start. <laughs> uh, you know, the first open-air preaching, uh, the oldest Methodist building, and, of course, what other people know of, of the class meetings, which, again, were established in the new room. It was a way in which Wesley was able to pay off the debt associated with the construction of the building. Um, and he talked about it was, quote, the very thing that we wanted. He recognised that not only would it support the, uh, the paying off of the debt, but that it was also a way in which those who were appointed into leadership roles could then undertake pastoral care and concern for those who uh, 
uh, were either not able to come to a weekly meeting or had missed a couple of meetings. So I think Wesley, again, introduces something which now we very much associate with the Methodist movement. Uh, and again, that happened because of his experiences at the new room in, in Bristol. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that all of us would identify that, of course, when we talk about Bible study groups, class meetings, it's a way in which we can share together within a, a small group environment. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's just a remarkable story to me that, that yet again, it's the city of Bristol which really um, steps up and gets Wesley to that point of saying, yep, yeah, that's another thing which we will adopt for the early Methodist movement. One of the things that strikes me, the parallels, and I think this is true probably at the birth of the Protestant Reformation is that and that parallels so much back to this to Jesus and the story of the religious institution mm. right the yeah. church yeah. that was established and yet was it seems really self-righteous and hypocritical and all about like who's worthy to get in and who's not worthy to get in and Jesus goes to the people that the church doesn't make space for you yes. know the prostitutes the sinners the tax collectors even when he turns over the table Mm. of the in the marketplace it's because they put the tables up in the in the in the place of the gentiles the courtyard of the gentiles that was where the outsiders were able to come and worship and they had placed you know shops up in that space that was supposed to be a place of worship for the outsiders right yes. for the for the god fears but that were not jews and that was what jesus you know knocked that all down and then you hear the story the same with martin luther you know the selling of indulgences and mm -hmm, the corruption mm -hmm. of the church and and the manipulation of the people who couldn't read and didn't really understand faith and here you see the same thing it's like these are minors all these people have really no access to faith and life and mm -hmm. food for the soul and community and uh, and <laughs> then he goes out and preaches in the streets which is they're not supposed to do right and that's where he says i submit to be more vile or vulgar or whatever it is yes. uh, and 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 the church is like unhappy with him the bishop tries to send him to cease and desist and uh it's, it's like all these parallels whenever you see these religious movements that that sort of move to me, that says something about kind of where we are today and how we model ministry is that the church should always be on that inbreaking path to be about yeah. reaching the people that the church says, well, I don't know that those are the people we should be reaching. Yeah. And yet you still even today see church, churches, you know, building the walls or separating themselves or saying who's worthy of being in and who's worthy of being out based yeah. on like, oh, how you live or what you do or who you vote for or well, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just fascinating yeah. to continue to see that when the rena renewal and revival comes, yeah. there's a modeling of almost that exact same right. thing in the New Testament. Right. Yeah. One of the... Um we, we would we would have um, reflections among our group every evening after we had been somewhere and kind of discussing what it what do we learn or what are we thinking about uh, after having been there that day and one of the, the themes that especially at the new room that keeps coming kept coming up was you know to to what extent have we become <laughs> the people who won't let the colliers in <laughs> uh, to what extent are we giving birth to the need for a new John Wesley uh, yeah I mean I think that that just keeps happening in and the life of the church. We've been talking about with our staff, you know, this in kind of, th you were around early on when I first came and talking about advocacy and inquiry, you know, and that most of us are only advocates. We only advocate for our own position. We're always protecting ourselves from threat and embarrassment and everything else. But you have to have a mind of inquiry where you ask questions. But a big part of inquiry is when you come to the table advocating for whatever it is you're about, you're also willing, to, and, and someone who has an inquiring mind, it says, how am I contributing to the problem that's yes, before us? Exactly. It's a yeah, sense of self-awareness. Yeah. Yes. And I think the church in England in the 18th century, I was telling you the other night, I took a class in seminary, sounds, you would love it, <laughs> right? It was moralism in the Church of England in the 18th century. I remember that class and I was like, Steve Gunner taught that class. Hmm. I think I still have the textbook and I will be glad to give it to you <laughs> if you want. But I just remember reading it. It was, it was a, a cultural mindset within the church that wasn't really about personal faith so much. Um, it was really about status and size. And they, it was this movement of moralism that as long as you do your duty and you live your role and you participate as as, you, as society says you're a good person, right? Then you're fine. Mm 
It wasn't about personal faith, which is why, you know, for John Wesley, Hmm. several years before he started the new room, he went to America and didn't work out real well. But he had this awakening of, because he came out of that moralism, that church where it was all about Mm -hmm. what you do. And there was something that happened in him that changed him. Uh, whether some people said it was a, a, a salvation moment or a renewal Holy Spirit filled mm-hmm. moment that kind of changed the, the heart way. strangely warm it was a process for him but he started like he said he started looking out and go I have to be more vile than the yeah. rules say mm-hmm. absolutely and I think in that sense Wesley did change during his time but I think for me what is so critical is that he was faithful to what God had called him to do and to be uh, and I think that the time in Savannah was a learning experience. Um, and, you know, I know that there are different thoughts and different views. But for me, when we look at it from the perspective of how did he take that experience and learn from it, I think it was a learning experience. So uh, sometimes, you know, we have to take one step back, maybe to take two steps forward. Uh, and I think that's maybe what happened to John. Uh, we've just referenced the heartwarming experience in London, the, the 1738 Aldersgate experience. Um, and again, the following year is when he arrives in Bristol for the first time. Um, so I think that it, you know there is a definite sort of timeline um, where you know Wesley is uh, reflecting on his experiences in ministry, learning from them, and then putting into action what he believes the next steps are being seeking guidance from god as to what that that should be it's occurring to me as i'm hearing you describe this wesley probably didn't have a long-term strategic plan he he asked himself what's the right thing to do today Mm -hmm. (laughs) and based on what i learned yesterday yeah yeah and and i would agree with that bob i think that uh, in that sense you know we talked about his sort of practical theology and and uh, yeah i think that wesley was if you like you know making decisions quote on the hoof but the reason why i think he was many would say successful in those calls that he made was because you know his heart was set for god and he he committed everything to god and to prayer and to study and to find a way forward um for the next sort of you know stage of the development of Methodism. Um, so I think as far as um, John's experience in, in Bristol is concerned, I think that so much of what happens is then essentially used as the template for the movement to be taken to other parts of the country. London, of course, is the capital city, Newcastle up in the northeast. Um, but I think that he, he takes all of those experiences and puts them to good effect. Um, One of the things I think also worth saying is that, of course, we do know the whole John Wesley story from the beginning, the middle, right through to the end. Uh, But as you said a moment ago, Bob, what John had to do was essentially Mm. live it in real time. Mm. And in terms of the calls that he made, I think because he was so in touch with God and what he believed God's purpose was for himself and his ministry, I think many would look back and say, yeah, the right calls were made. Uh, I mean, I can't think of too many other people whose lives have been dissected in the way that John Wesley's <laughs> life has been dissected. Mm. You know, there are libraries of biographies mm. and uh, commentaries on, you know, John Wesley and why did he do this? Why mm. did he say that? Um, and I think sometimes there's a sense in which, you know, we need to ask ourselves, how would I respond if somebody wrote such a detailed biography of my life? You know, <laughs> what prompted John to do that on that day? What prompted Bob to say that on that day? You know, why did David behave in that way on that day? So I think from that point of view, what, what, what John does is essentially make the calls right ones because of his uh, you know walking step in step with well and also what you have with him that you don't get with a lot of other reformers if you are like a calvin or a martin luther or others is that while they were sort of building out or extrapolating like theology yeah. i mean what you have from wesley is journals the guy yes. journaled everything. I mean, like, and was very honest. And, and a diary that was written in code. And a diary code. in code. And you even mentioned he was, I hate to say, he was a little bit of a, a smart ass sometimes 
<laughs> about can you, talk. Can you, can you say that on a podcast? Uh, yeah, I can say whatever I want on the podcast, and then I, Jeff just bleeps it out if my mother emails and says she doesn't like it. But um, <laughs> but you were talking about the book review on his. Uh, the medical book that he wrote. Mm. Primitive Physic, yes. He, he, wrote, he was way ahead of his time. He wrote this book on primitive, for, for just a normal person yes. uh, who didn't have access to health care and things like that. Talk, talk about that. I love the, the letter he wrote to mm. the reviewer. Yeah, so uh, again, a very practical response. Uh, many of those involved with the early Methodist movement, uh, of course, were poor. They were not able to afford medicines or access to a doctor. And so Wesley, based on his experience of meeting people, travelling across the country, uh, essentially put together uh, a compendium of ideas that people could try to deal with some of the uh, sort of pain and medical issues that they were dealing with. Wesley had no formal training as a doctor, uh, but even so, it is the most uh, uh, popular and well-published non-religious book that John ever wrote. Hmm. The story is that it was reviewed by um, an eminent doctor in a London newspaper in which he was highly critical of it and said, this man is not to be trusted, he has no medical training, it's essentially nothing more than quack medicine. Uh, sales of John Wesley's book subsequently increased. And so John then writes to the editor of the newspaper with the words, concerning the dear doctor's review, I wish to advise him that since he wrote it, sales of my book have increased and if he would like to review any more of my publications <laughs> then he is most welcome uh, so never let which it is the said. 18th century version of like a major slap down right that's like that's about as nice as you can just yeah and for me that illustrates the point that john wesley did have a sense of humor uh, yes, of mm. course, the man we know had to be very focused, had to mm. be very driven, was the leader of the movement, knew that mm. in order to remain um, focused on the ministry, uh, that there wasn't a lot of time for uh, you know brevity and laughter. But uh, I think that that little story, to mm. me, illustrates that John Wesley had a sense of humour. The other one, which I love to share, if you indulge me for a moment, is... Um, the city of Bath, which is about 10 miles east of <coughs> Bristol. And Bath in the 18th century was where people would come to take the waters, uh, which was seen as sort of healing and uh, recovery. Um, however, whilst the ladies came for that, the gentlemen tended to come for cards and other sports. Uh, perhaps we could describe Bath as the 18th century Vegas. <laughs> you know, what happened in Bath stayed in Bath. Uh, one particular, uh, I suppose, uh, gentleman um, who was illustrative of this attitude was a gentleman called Bo Nash. And Bo Nash challenged John Wesley on a number of occasions when he was speaking in the city. Uh, and Wesley came up with some quite witty put downs. But the one that I like best uh, is that the story is that the two of them were on a path in the city uh, walking towards each other but there was only room <coughs> for one person mm. to pass and as they encounter each other Bo Nash says to John Wesley sir I do not give way to fools at this point Wesley then steps off the paths into the mud and says <laughs> to Bo Nash but I do sir and allows him to pass <laughs> brilliant That's pretty quick yeah <laughs> yeah so you know I think that Anybody, and I'm sure all of us around this table would, would identify that, you know, when you are preaching or speaking, there can always be that moment where somebody comes back at you with something. And I think that it's imperative that where you can, you know, you can come back with something that always, always you hope will be witty and humorous, but ultimately is a good line to come back with. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't think John Wesley perhaps had a, a role in um, as a comedian, but uh, <laughs> he certainly knew how to deal with hecklers. So let me get your thoughts on some contemporary things, because one of the things I think, and I'm, you may have mentioned this, or maybe we were talking about it somewhere else, is like everyone always wants to co-opt the historical figures for their own purposes. I think we're all guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. We all do this. Okay, so this is not a judgment on one particular group or other. Uh, the Methodist or the Wesleyan revival movement has spurred lots of denominations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, some of those, unfortunately, in our early history here in the United States are rooted around slavery and, mm-hmm. um, and uh, race, uh, a lot of them, actually, a lot of our splits and schisms. Right. You know, I, I guess I think it was you or maybe someone else said, you know, so who does John Wesley belong to? Really, no one owns John Wesley. He doesn't belong to anyone. But he does land in a sphere and a space that is unique to him and his identity and who he is. And I think as we're wrestling with um, not just current things, like you have churches that like the United Methodist Churches or the Methodist Church split in the 1840s and then came back together and then there was actually a greater union and then there was 1968 so there's been this path of back and forth but as i look at historically the major american branch of methodism while may may have had some offshoots splintering for the most part the main major artery has split and come back together in the united methodist church now we're having another what i would define as a splintering it's not a major separation or breach or whatever um, and I've, I've learned that uh, just as I've come to accept the reality that divorce is uh, something that is, it, it's real and, and we lament mm-hmm. that that happens within churches too. But how do we talk about John Wesley when you have <laughs> Nazarenes and Wesleyans and Methodists and British Methodists and um, you know all these different groups? I mean, how do you think about it as representing a historical location that represents the beginnings of John Wesley and ministry? How do you think about how that connects to all these different pieces and parts. And I guess what are the warnings that you would give to any of us who try to own John Wesley? Um, And if we think that we're going to do that, I guess the admonition would be, you know, sometimes we want certain parts of what he was about (laughs) and and not other parts of what Mm -hmm. he was about. I don't even know if that's a, a great question or not. It's just really your thoughts as you think about, I mean, You've lived this, you know this, the history of this, you've read all the things about him, and as you're just kind of observing Methodism and Wesleyanism now, how do, what, are, what are just your thoughts or observations on all that? I think you're absolutely right to say that there have been splits and then comings together that have really gone on since the 18th century. Uh, Wesley himself, of course, described as the Wesleyan Methodists. We had breaks with the primitive Methodists, the free Methodists. Those only came back together in Britain in the 1930s. So in that sense, I think that we recognise that there will be splits and comings together, splits and comings together. I think it is true to say that uh, anybody from a, quote, Methodist tradition, I think, will look to John Wesley and seek to uh, understand how to deal with some of the issues that we're facing today and say, well, how would John Wesley? Um, I've often sort of uh, remarked jokingly, instead of the the bracelets to say, you know, what would Jesus do? Perhaps we should have a, a range of bracelets saying, what would John Wesley do? But I think, joking aside, I think that, for me, that's the important point, that we don't get fixated on John Wesley being the person who can give us all the answers Mm -hmm. to all of the questions. I'm always reminded when we have this type of discussion of Charles Wesley's words of God burying his workers but carrying on his work. And I think that we always have to remember and set the Wesleys in the 18th century context. Now, some of what they said, of course, and, you know, I'm coming to the United States and saying this, there is a lot that the Wesleys had to say and wrote that I think still means a lot to us and impacts upon our thinking and our lives and our theology. Hmm. But there are certain other elements that I would say, well, okay, John Wesley might not have written about that. He might not have said something about that. We always have to remember he was an 18th century Anglican clergyman. And in that sense, I think our understanding uh, and development over the last three centuries means that uh, I think we always have to look at Wesley's words through that filter. Um, so I think it's, it's good that people want to learn about the Wesleys, and ultimately, if you want to understand your Methodist DNA, then you have to understand John and Charles Wesley. I think if you want to understand the Methodist movement, then you have to understand what happened to John in Epworth, in Oxford, in London, and of course Bristol. Um, But I believe that we've been gifted intelligence and we should use that brain uh, 
to reflect and pray and read and develop our own knowledge and understanding about some of the questions that we're facing today. Uh, I think that, yes, it is a reality and a sadness that sometimes there has to be separation and divorce. But I think ultimately what it must always come back to is how are we seeking to be followers of Christ? And I think that John Wesley would be surprised if you'd said to him in 1739, the work that you will begin in the city of Bristol will essentially create the template for the Methodist movement, which will grow into a church. It will grow around the world. And I think John would, in many respects, be deeply surprised about that. But I think he would also say, if it's what God wants for my ministry, then God will deliver. So I think it's important that we understand the Wesley story, both John and Charles, but I think it's also important that we wrestle with the questions that we have today and to seek God's understanding and will about how we should deal with these questions. Um, and I think ultimately what it must come down to is how are we seeking to serve the Lord today? How are we seeking to be disciples in what we do with our daily lives? Um, of course, John and Charles Wesley are people who sought to do that, and I think God blessed them in that work and that ministry. Um, but I think it's also important that we have that personal relationship with God to allow him to guide us as to how we should be living our which lives Which was a today. key part of his, which make, you know, was, one of the reasons I love being Methodist, Wesleyan, mm -hmm. is it is very much uh, evangelical in the sense of a personal relationship with God, with Jesus, mm -hmm. that Wesley experienced for himself, right? But there's also this importance that your faith is mm -hmm. lived out in, in what you do. Yes, mm -hmm. um, and I've shared the story before. I may have shared the podcast the other day about Millard Fuller, who helped start mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity. Right. And I, right. I knew Millard from South Georgia and a couple of retreats we did together. And and I just remember how he he was Southern Baptist, and he would always talk about, "Yeah, I just can't get Southern Baptists to come work on Habitat houses." He goes, "But man, Methodist, yeah. every Methodist church sends teams." Yeah. He always appreciated that, and he would even speak about the DNA of Methodists. And John Wesley, he was, Miller was a smart dude. Mm. And he knew all that. And he knew that like your DNA is rooted in, my faith has to work out in the world, right. has to reach people in the world that don't have what I have. And that that's part of the gospel. It's mind, body, mm. spirit, and relationships. So when we do our healing services mm -hmm. in our Methodist tradition, you know, we, we pray for healing of, of body, mind, spirit and relationships, mm -hmm. the holistic aspect mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. that. So that's one of the things, it's one of the reasons why I always say too, we come out of the Church of England, so we have our liturgy, we have our litany, you know, that we follow our book of mm -hmm. worship that we go by. And so we have the evangelical personal relationship, yet we have the historical, the liturgy and the ritual and the robes and all that we go through and the creeds and the articles, which is why I always say that when a Catholic marries a Baptist, you have now created a Methodist, a Methodist. family. <laughs> I think there's great merit in that statement, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, th I think f for me, uh, it's important that we recognize the significance of the lives of John and Charles Wesley. Um, but I do think that it's important that, as Charles said, you know, God buries his workers but carries on his work. And I think what's important is that each of us seek what it is that God wants to do with us in our lives and we make that commitment um, and you know be prepared to be more vile to go out and do things which you think you might not have the skill set or the training for but as we know from our Bible you know so often God calls those who are least prepared least in their minds at least able to do what it is that God is asking of them um, and you know when John and Charles return from Georgia, uh, I think they both returned crushed men. Uh, their great ministry of preaching and engaging with the colonists and with the savages is in ruins. Um, and yet God finds a way to use that experience in a positive way. Um, so who knows what it is that each of us are going to be called to do. Uh, I think we have to be open 
to what it is and to respond accordingly. And I think that's what John did, that's what Charles did, and that's the reason why we still love to talk about them now, because I think they are wonderful examples of people who said, I will respond to what God is calling me to do, what he's calling me and my life to be, um, and you know, a constant source of inspiration as a result of that. Um, but make no mistake, um, it's important that we seek God's will for our lives, not we come fixated on all things John and Charles, as great a story as it is, and oh, I yeah, want yeah. to share that story, absolutely, but um, we must not create icons of these two men. We must recognise that God bless them, but we have a work to do today. And one of the things I feel very strongly about when I talk to groups who come to the new room I love to share the history of the story, and we've touched on that during the course of this podcast. But I think it's important that those who, who you know, leave the building, maybe an hour later, a day later, that they take that experience, and that is a, a well in which they can continue to draw from. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important that people are able to take that experience and to go back to their respective homes and communities and serve and lead and do all of the things that God's calling them to do. And just remember that the reason why they're able to do that is because of God's blessing on their life and the discipleship which they're showing in the same way as John and Charles did in the 18th century. None of us know how our ministry will impact. It may well be that there will be an immediate effect I've often talked about the parable of the seed and the sower. I get to speak to thousands of people every year at the New Room, but many of them, of course, will be going back to their homes, and I don't know how that impacts. I perhaps have to accept that some of it will fall on stony ground and will produce no fruit. Some of it may fall on ground which begins to see some growth, but then withers. But I hope that we also see some fruit that follows from it. Um, but ultimately, my responsibility is to continue to sow the sow seed. The seed, yeah, yeah. I, when I was thinking tonight, we have a men's study, and we're doing uh, Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward. And I just think about John, well, and Charles' time in Georgia. You can say it was a failure or whatever. At, he uses an analogy of learning to ride a bike, and that we all have to fall in order to learn what balance feels like. Because if you are learning to ride a bike and you never fall, uh, mm. you know, then you never learn what balance is versus what balance is not. Mm. Yes. So you have to fall a bunch in order to know what balance feels like yeah. yes. to learn that. Yeah. And I think that's true in life. I think for, uh, for John Wesley, whatever he thought he was going to do heroically to go over to Georgia and save all the savages, the Indians, or they, whatever they called them back in the day in the 18th yes. century. Yes. Um, and in some ways, it, it, he even kind of felt it was a failure for him that he didn't really do what he set out there to do. Not only was he a failure in his ministry, at least in his mind, he was a failure in love. He had fallen in love with Sophie Hopke, and uh, that went south in a big way. So I, always, you know, I always thought that when when he got back to London after um, his really bad experience in Georgia and Savannah, um, and I, you know, I think in some ways he was a really broken man. Um, broken in the sense that his dreams had not come through. Maybe his expectations for himself had not come to fulfillment. And, and yet it was shortly after that, right, just within weeks, that he had the Aldersgate experience, uh, which well, maybe it wasn't a conversion experience, but it certainly was the launch point uh, for what happened later. Um, you know, even when you're feeling at your most broken, that might be the moment when God's about to use you in a big way. And we tend to, you know, give up on ourselves at that you're point. You're also more receptive for something to happen. Yeah. Like yeah. you said, he had, you kept talking about his call, his call, his call. I mean, he had this clarity of call. I think sometimes you have to sort that out. I mean, I know I did, even though I was called from a very young age, I had to go through that first few years of, of season of ministry to go, is this really what... And there were some things that happened that finally get you to the point, so, oh, this is what I'm called to do. Yeah. Yes, and I, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's often when we are at our most broken that God is able to come in and say, there is a way forward here. And uh, perhaps we are more receptive in those moments than we might be otherwise. 
uh, you know, we sometimes need to get taken out of our comfort zone and challenged in a way that we fall before God and say, I cannot do this in my own strength. Um, and I come to you in all humility and say, use me as you wish. And I think that's where God says, and I will lift you up. And that's yeah. where clarity then begins to emerge and the calling that you are responding to. Well, we could talk about John. Well, you, Bob, you and Bob could talk about John Wesley for days and days and, and have. days. And have. <laughs> and so, but, but we are limited in time and scope on podcasts and that sort of thing. But I, th- I do think before we leave, for people who may want to learn more about New Room, or who may want to maybe investigate and in ways to maybe even be supportive of the work and the ministry that you do in this place, which I think actually is, you know, it's so funny, we're struggling with models of the modern church, and one of these mm-hmm. models is like uh, the, all these church facilities and buildings that we have everywhere that are in decline. It's mm-hmm. like, how do they become missional outposts, community mm-hmm. outposts, mm-hmm. service outposts, food? We have a campus that's in a way doing that. It's like modeled off of what John Wesley did in 1739. But if people are interested in learning more or maybe supporting the ministry that you have there, talk about how they can do that. So probably the best way, particularly folks uh, listening to us uh, in the US, would be the website, which is New Room Bristol. That's all one word, newroombristol.org.uk. And we could put that in the show notes. That's all right. And uh, as you look at the, the homepage, there will be um, the menu, which will allow you to then identify how you can support us. Um, uh, we have access to PayPal and other means, so if folks want to, it would be great. What we also want to encourage people to do, if they're able to, is to think about coming over to the UK um, in the same way as Bob spoke earlier about the impact that it had upon him and those who came over from the Chapelwood um, Church, that uh, these are experiences which live with people for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And I think that there is nothing quite like being in that space and understanding the significance of the story that unfolded in that space in the 18th century. So uh, if that's something, again, you'd be interested in doing, then you can contact us directly and I can put you in touch with uh, tour groups based here in the US and uh, they would be happy to guide you through as to undertaking a, a Wesley Heritage tour to the UK. Um, maybe even think about uh, enjoying some of your own Wesley heritage here in the United States. Bob mentioned a little earlier um, there are some significant sites uh, in the Northeast, in New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, as well, of course, in southern Georgia with places like Savannah and Epworth by the Sea. Um, but I think ultimately, um, the best support, really, I think you could do is is within your own church, your own community. You know, how is it that I can be Wesleyan? How is it that I can submit to be more vile and find out ways in which there is work that I can be doing in my local community? Because that essentially touches you back to that DNA of what Wesley begins in Bristol. Um, so I hope that that's helpful to folks when they reflect on ways in which they may uh, make a, a, a commitment. We'd love to welcome you to Bristol, um, but there is work to be done within your local communities as well. Um, but of course, uh, we value any um, support, financial or otherwise, that people are able to offer. And uh, if you are coming, um, do let me know, because I'd love to say hello. <laughs> That'd be great. Well, David, thank you so much for being with us. And Bob, thanks for joining thank us. Thank you for inviting being me. Being here with us. We have yeah. a, hey, a few. Make sure you subscribe and like the podcast. Leave a rating. That always helps. You can always do that. That's uh, very helpful to get the word out. And we have a way we sign off on the podcast where I just say my name, and then you say your name, and then you say your name, and then you don't have anything else to do after that. I mean, you're done, the podcast at least. Well, I'm John Stevens. David Worthington. And Bob Johnson. And this is Pod Have Mercy. Thank you.